A sample of boron contains the isotopes 10b and 11b. The relative atomic mass of the boron sample is 10.8. What is the percentage of 11b atoms in the sample of boron? A. 8%, B. 20%, C. 80%, or D. 92%. If we imagine this like a number line, the relative atomic mass will fall somewhere between 10 and 11 depending on the percentages of 10b and 11b. The relative atomic mass of the boron sample is 10.8, so it's more towards the 11 on our number line. Therefore, it's going to have a higher percentage of 11b atoms in the boron sample. And if we were to decide, it would be 80% of 11b and 20% of 10b, and that would create our relative atomic mass of 10.8. We could check this by doing 20 times 10 over 100 plus 80 times 11 over 100. This is how you work out relative atomic mass using isotopes, and this would equal 10.8. Therefore, our answer is 80, so C, to get the mark for this question, you need to write C in the answer box. In the compound ICl2 plus SbCl6 minus, the oxidation number of chlorine is minus 1. What is the oxidation numbers of I and Sb in the compound? Our options are A, I is plus 1 and Sb is plus 5. B, I is plus 1 and Sb is plus 7. C, I is plus 3 and Sb is plus 5, or D, I is plus 3 and Sb is plus 7. If we take the individual ions, starting with the cation, I, Cl2 plus, let's work out the oxidation state of I or iodine. So, working out chlorine, we, we're told in the question, that chlorine has an oxidation number of minus 1. So we have minus 1 times 2. That equals minus 2. The overall charge of this cation is plus 1. Therefore, the oxidation state of iodine must be plus 3 because plus 3 minus 2 is equal to plus 1. Therefore, looking at our options, it will either be C or D and we can eliminate B and A. Now let's look at our anion. The anion is SbCl6 minus. Again, we're told that chlorine has an oxidation number of minus one. So the oxidation number of Cl6 would be minus one times six, which gives us minus six. The overall charge of this anion is minus one, making the oxidation number of Sb plus 5 because plus 5 minus 6 equals minus 1. So looking at our options, plus 5 is option C. So to get the marks for this question we need to write C in the answer box provided. What is the number of hydrogen atoms in 0.125 moles of C2H5OH? Let's begin by working out how many hydrogen atoms are in the compound we've been given. Well, we have 5, H5, and then H from the OH. That's a total of 6. So we need to multiply the number of moles, 0.125, by 6, which gives us 0.75 moles of hydrogen atoms. And then to convert the moles into the number of hydrogen atoms, we need to multiply the moles by Avogadro's constant, which is 0.75 multiplied by 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So Avogadro's constant is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. That gives us a value of 4.515 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen. Looking at our options, that matches option B, 
So to get the mark for this question, we need to write B in the answer box provided. A student titrates a standard solution of barium hydroxide, BaOH2, with nitric acid, HNO3. 25 centimetres cubed of 0.045 moles per decimeter cubed barium hydroxide are needed to neutralise 23.35 centimetres cubed of HNO3 aqueous. What is the concentration in moles per decimeter cubed of nitric acid? A. 0.0241. B. 0.0482. C. 0.0900. Or D. 0.0964. Let's begin this question by writing the equation for this titration. If we start by writing our reagents, barium hydroxide and nitric acid, we would then form barium nitrate or BaNO3 2 and water. Next, we need to balance this equation. To balance this equation, we need to write a 2 in front of our nitric acid and a 2 in front of our waters. If we then just take a note of the molar ratio of barium hydroxide to nitric acid, it's a 1 to 2 molar ratio. So, our next step is to work out the number of moles of barium hydroxide. We can do this using volume and concentration and the equation triangle NVC. So, using our volume and concentration to work out moles, we do 25 times 10 to the negative 3 because we're converting centimetres cubed into decimetres cubed. Then we multiply this by 0 0.045 and that gives us an answer of 1.125 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. This is of barium hydroxide. We want to work out nitric acid and the moles of nitric acid and it's a 1 to 2 molar ratio so we need to multiply 1.125 times 10 to the negative 3 by 2, that gives us a value of 2.25 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Finally, we're asked to work out concentration. We're given the volume of nitric acid used, so using the same equation triangle we can take the number of moles, 2.25 times 10 to the negative 3, that's the moles of nitric acid, divide this by 23.35 times 10 to the negative 3, again converting centimetres cubed into decimetres cubed. That gives us a concentration value of 0 0.0964. If we look at the options we've been given in the question, the answer we've calculated in moles per decimetre cubed, well, this matches our option D. So to get the mark for this question, we need to write D in the answer box provided. Which statement best explains why nitrogen has a larger first ionisation energy than oxygen? A. Nitrogen atoms have less repulsion between p orbital electrons than oxygen atoms. B. Nitrogen atoms have a smaller nuclear charge than oxygen atoms. C. Nitrogen atoms lose an electron from the 2s subshell while oxygen atoms lose an electron from the 2p subshell. D. Nitrogen atoms have an odd number of electrons, while oxygen atoms have an even number. Let's begin by looking at statement A. To answer statement A, we need to draw out the electron arrangement of nitrogen and oxygen in the p orbitals. So p orbitals would be three squares, as I'm drawing. And if we look on a periodic table, we notice that nitrogen in the P block has three, is three away or into the P block. So its arrangement would be one electron spinning up in each P orbital. For oxygen, it's four away or into the P block. So it'd be three like with nitrogen, but one would have to have two. And therefore oxygen would have more repulsion between these two electrons with the same charge and then they're going to repel each other whereas nitrogen is a lot more stable there's less repulsion therefore a is correct however let's check the other options and see that we can confirm that a is correct for b 
well, it's saying that nitrogen has a smaller nuclear charge. Generally, if something has a high nuclear charge, it's got a high first ionization energy because there's more nuclear attraction. Therefore, this doesn't really fit the fact that nitrogen has a higher first ionization energy. So our answer is not B. For C, well, nitrogen and oxygen are both going to lose their electrons from the 2P subshell because that is the most or least stable. They're going to donate them from the 2P before the 2S. Then for D, nitrogen atoms have an odd number of electrons while oxygen atoms have an even number of electrons. The number of electrons doesn't matter when it comes to ionization energy. We know this because the general trend of ionization energy across the periodic table is a diagonal line from left to right. And this means that it's increasing as it switches from an odd to even number of electrons. Therefore, the number of electrons can't have any effect. So it's not C and it's not D. Therefore, our answer is confirmed that it's A. To get the mark for this question, we need to write A in the answer box provided. In the periodic table, element X is in group 2 and element Y is in group 15 or 5. What is the likely formula of an ionic compound of X and Y? A. X2Y5 B. X2Y3 C. X3Y2 D. X5Y2 The charge for an element in group 2 is plus 2. So X would have the charge plus 2. And for group 5, the charge is minus 3. So Y would have the charge 3 minus. There is a method when write, working out ionic compounds or writing their formulas, and it's called the crossover method, there, which means this 2 goes to the Y, making it Y2, and this 3 goes to the X, making it X3. If we look at this answer and the options we're given, our answer we've calculated matches the option C. So to get the mark for this question, we need to write C in the answer box provided. Which statement about ammonium carbonate is not correct? A. It reacts with barium nitrate to form a white precipitate. B. It effervesces with dilute nitric acid. C. It releases an alkaline gas with warm NaOH. D. It has the formula NH4CO3. Option A says that barium nitrate and ammonium carbonate forms a white precipitate. The white precipitate formed in this reaction would be barium carbonate. Barium carbonate is a white precipitate or a white solid that would show in this reaction. Therefore, A is correct and we're looking for something that's not correct. So, A is not the option or the correct answer for this question. Moving on to B, something effervesces or a gas is produced when anything is effervescing and we're told that it's the reaction of ammonium carbonate and dilute nitric acid. The gas that's going to be produced and therefore the reaction will be known as effervescing is carbon dioxide. So B is also correct and cannot be the answer for this question. Moving on to C, ammonium carbonate um, reacts with sodium hydroxide to produce an alkaline gas. Option C is also correct and the alkaline gas that's produced is ammonia gas, which is NH3. Therefore, our, op or our answer option must be D. And we know this because we can check. The charge for an ammonium ion is plus one and the charge for a carbonate ion is minus two. Therefore, the correct formula is NH4 brackets 2 CO3 and therefore you've got 2 plus 1 charges or 2 plus overall and a minus 2 making the overall charge 0 which is what you want for a formula of a compound. Therefore to get the mark for this question you need to write D in the answer box provided. 
A reaction is first order with respect to a reactant X. Which rate concentration graph for reactant X is the correct shape? We have four different graphs presented to us. We need to focus on the key pieces of information in the question. The fact the reaction is first order and that the graph is a rate concentration graph. So the graph A, this is correct. This shows a rate concentration graph for a first order reaction. If we look at the other options though, just to confirm, B is showing a concentration time graph for a first order reaction. C is showing a zero order reaction, so zero order for a rate concentration graph. And D is showing a second order for a rate concentration graph. Therefore, we have confirmed our answer is A. And to get the mark for this question, we need to write A in the answer box provided. The reversible reaction of sulphur dioxide and oxygen to form sulphur trioxide is shown below. An equilibrium mixture contains 2.4 moles of sulphur dioxide, 1.2 moles of oxygen and 0.4 moles of sulphur trioxide. The total pressure is 250 atmospheres. What is the partial pressure of sulphur trioxide? A. 15 atmospheres B. 25 atmospheres C. 100 atmospheres or D. 200 atmospheres To work out partial pressure, you need to take the mole fraction and multiply this by the total pressure in the system. To work out the mole fraction of sulphur trioxide, you need to take the moles of sulphur trioxide, 0.4, divide them by the total moles, that would be taking 2.4 and 1.2, and then adding this to 0.4 and this gives us the mole fraction of 0.1 then we multiply this by the total pressure which we've been given is 250 atmospheres so 0.1 times 250 gives us a partial pressure of sulfur trioxide at 25 atmospheres looking at the options provided our calculated answer matches option b so to get the mark for this question, we need to write B in the answer box provided. A buffer solution is prepared by mixing 200 centimeters cubed of two moles per decimeter cubed propanoic acid with 600 centimeters cubed of one mole per decimeter cubed sodium propanoate. The Ka for propanoic acid is 1.32 times 10 to the negative five moles per decimeter cubed. What is the pH of the buffer solution? A. 4.58, B, 4.70, C, 5.06, or D, 5.18. Firstly, we need to work out the concentration of propanoic acid and sodium propanoate in the buffer solution. We do this by working out their moles and dividing it by the total volume. Moles of propanoic acid and sodium propanoate can be worked out by using volume and concentration. We can work out their moles by taking the volume, so 200 times 10 to the negative 3 because we're converting centimetres cubed into decimetres cubed. Multiplying this by 2 gives us 0.4 moles of propanoic acid. The total volume is 200 plus 600, so it's 0.4 moles divided by 800 times 10 to the negative 3 decimetres cubed. That gives us 5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per decimeter cubed. Then for sodium propanoate, same process, 600 times 10 to the negative 3 multiplied by 1 gives us 0.6 moles. We take these 0.6 moles, divide it by 800 times 10 to the negative 3 decimeters cubed. That gives us concentration in the buffer solution of 7.5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per decimeter cubed. Next, we need to look at the other, inf other information in the question. That's using Ka, which is 1.32 times 10 to the negative 5. The equation for Ka is the salt or A minus times H plus over HA. This is a general equation. If we apply our specific example, that would be 1.32 times 10 to the negative 5 equals 7.5 times 10 to the negative 3 in square brackets because it's concentration 
times by h plus divided by 5 times 10 to the negative 3, because that's the concentration of propanoic acid in the buffer. Then if we rearrange for H+, plus, we can rearrange by multiplying the denominator across and then dividing the 7.5 times 10 to the negative 3 by the answer we calculated. That would give us a value of H+, plus at 8.8 .8 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per decimeter cubed. Then we need to use the equation negative log 10 times the concentration of H plus gives us pH. So that would be negative log 10 multiplied by 8.8 .8 times 10 to the negative 6. That gives us 5.06. If we compare our calculated answer to the options in the question, it matches option C. So to get the answer or mark for this question, we need to write C in the answer box provided. The table below shows standard enthalpies. What is the enthalpy change in joules per mole per Kelvin for the following reaction? A, minus 219.1, B, minus 88.5, C, plus 88.5, or D, plus 219.1. To work out standard enthalpy change of this equation, we need to work backwards. In standard terms, this means products minus reactants. So if we look at our products, CH3OH or methanol, we've been given the standard enthalpy of methanol. And so we need to do 239.7 minus, because that's our products, minus our reactants. Our reactants are 197.6. We know this in the table because we've been given and it matches one of our reactants plus 2 times 130.6. I've multiplied the enthalpy of hydrogen by 2 because there is a 2 in front of the hydrogen in the equation. This gives us a value of minus 219.1 joules per mole per Kelvin. Units stay the same because we haven't worked out joules, moles or Kelvin or done anything with them which would change the units. We then need to look at the calculated value and compare it to the options in the question. Our calculated value matches option one. So to get the mark or A, to get the mark for this question, we need to write A in the answer box. The redox equilibria for a hydrogen-oxygen fuel cell in alkaline solution are shown below. What is the equation for the overall cell reaction? A. H2 gas plus 4OH minus aqueous goes to 3H2O liquid plus half O2 gas. B. 3H2O liquid plus half O2 goes to hydrogen or H2 gas plus 4OH minus aqueous. C. H2O liquid plus H2 gas plus half O2 gas. Or D. H2 gas plus half O2 gas goes to H2O liquid. Firstly, we need to work out our own overall cell reaction. We do this by using electrode potentials, which we've been given. The most negative means the equilibrium is going to go backwards and the most positive will go forwards. So rewriting this, we would have H2 plus 2OH minus plus half O2 plus H2O goes to 2H2O plus 2 electrons. Oh, we also have 2 electrons in our reactants and then plus 2OH minus. We then need to cancel out some of our reactants and products that match. So the electrons disappear and we don't have to change or multiply either equation by anything because we've got two electrons in both. And that means that it's balanced and it's fine. Then we can cancel out our 2OH minuses because they match we can also cancel out one water and then the water from the reactants. So rewriting this equation, that gives us H2 gas plus half O2 gas produces 
H2O liquid. If we look at what we've calculated and compare it to the options we get in the question, the answer we've worked out matches option D. So to get the mark for this question, you need to write D in the answer box provided. Which enthalpy changes are or is or are endothermic? One, bond enthalpy of CH bond. Two, second electron affinity of oxygen. Three, the standard enthalpy change of formation of magnesium. A, one, two and three. B, only one and two. C, only two and three. Or D, only one. So if something is endothermic, it means its enthalpy change is going to be positive. For one, the bond enthalpy of a CH bond, that is positive, and therefore one is correct. So we can eliminate C. For number two, the, ele the second electron affinity of oxygen. So the first electron affinity is negative, but it says second electron affinity and you need more energy to remove a second electron because of the repulsion because if we were to write the equation that would be O minus plus an electron goes to O2 minus so it's the repulsion of the two negative charges therefore it's going to be positive so 2 is correct and we can eliminate D then for three, the standard enthalpy change of formation of magnesium, this is zero because magnesium is already naturally occurring in its standard thing. You don't need to, it's not a compound, so you don't have two different elements that you need to add. Therefore, it's not three, so we can eliminate A. That means our answer is B. So to get the mark for this question, we need to write B in the answer box provided. Which statement or statements explain or explains why reaction rates increase as temperature increases? One, the activation energy is less. Two, collisions between molecules are more frequent. Three, a greater proportion of molecules have energy greater than the activation energy. A, one, two, and three. B, only one and two. C, only two and three. Or D, only one. Activation energy will always stay the same no matter what happens with temperature, therefore 1 is false. Collisions between molecules are more frequent. This is true because the molecules are going to have more energy, more kinetic energy, they're going to collide more, they're bouncing around more, so that is true. And then 3, greater proportion of molecules have energy greater than activation energy. Well, if they have more kinetic energy and more temperature so thermal energy that's going to increase the energy that the molecules have and therefore they are going to have an energy greater than the activation energy so the reaction is more fruitful or more successful because more molecules or a greater proportion of molecules have an energy greater than activation energy so three is also correct therefore we're looking for an option that says two and three that option is c so to get the mark for this question we need to write c in the answer box provided. Which statement or statements is or are correct for the complex PT NH32 Cl2? 1. One of its stereoisomers is used as an anti-cancer drug. 2. It has bond angles of 109.5 degrees. 3. It has optical isomers. A. 1, 2 and 3. B. Only 1 and 2. C, only two and three, or D, only one. Statement one is correct, and one of the stereoisomers of this complex is used as an anti-cancer drug. This is something you need to know as part of the syllabus. So if you didn't know it, maybe make a revision resource with this statement. Number two, the bond angles are 109.5. This is a tetrahedral shape, which means four bond pairs, no lone pairs. This is false because of the lone pairs on the nitrogen. It has optical isomers. This is also false because an optical isomer would have four unique groups attached. And there aren't four unique groups because there are two NH groups and there are two CL groups. So this is false. Therefore, our answer is only one, which matches option D. To get the mark for this question, we need to write D 
in the answer box provided. This question is about enthalpy changes. Part A. Table 16.1 shows the enthalpy changes that can be used to determine the enthalpy change of hydration of fluoride ions, F-. Part 1. Explain what is meant by the term enthalpy change of hydration. Enthalpy change definitions are something you need to know from recall, and enthalpy change of hydration can be defined as 1 mole of gaseous, it's important we say gaseous, ions react, you could say react in water, but react is fine, to form 1 mole, again specifying the quantity is really important in definitions, of aqueous, but you could alternatively say hydrated because of the water that it reacts in, ions. So to get the two marks for this question, you need to say one mole of gaseous ions react, that's your first mark, and then to form one mole of aqueous slash hydrated ions is your second mark. Part two, the enthalpy change of hydration of F- can be determined using the enthalpy changes in table 16.1 and the incomplete energy cycle below. On the dotted lines, add the species present, including state symbols. Let's begin by filling in the lattice enthalpy arrows. Lattice enthalpy is when a solid compound is formed from its gaseous ions. So here I've written our solid product, calcium fluoride, and then its gaseous ions would be Ca2 plus gaseous, 2 plus because calcium is in group 2 and would have a 2 plus charge, plus 2F minus gaseous minus because fluorine's in group one and so fluoride ions would have a minus one charge. Now we only have two values left in our data table. We have a negative and a positive value for hydration of calcium 2 plus and solution of calcium fluoride. So there's only one positive arrow in this energy cycle and it's here. That means this arrow must represent the solution of calcium fluoride. And so we can fill in this dotted line. Solution of calcium fluoride is when this solid compound produces aqueous ions or its corresponding aqueous components. And so we can fill in and it will be Ca2 plus aqueous, 2F minus aqueous. And then we can fill in the arrow here, which must represent minus 1,609 and plus 13. And this arrow is representing the hydration of calcium 2 plus. So that means rather than having Ca2 plus gaseous ions, we're going to have aqueous ions and plus 2F minus gaseous because nothing's happened to the fluoride ions. To get the four marks for this question you must have each dotted line with the correct components or ions and the correct state symbols or compounds. Part 3. Calculate the enthalpy change of hydration of fluoride ions, F-. For part 3 we need to look at part 2 again. So here's part 2 and we've almost filled in all the values were given in the data table and their corresponding arrows. The final one is the lattice enthalpy, which is minus 2630. So if we just fill that in, in our energy cycle. Next, we need to fill in a algebra significance for the arrow for enthalpy change of hydration of F minus. So this would be 2x x if it was one enthalpy change but we're using two f minus ions throughout this whole energy cycle so we need to say two x now a bit like a hess's cycle rather than going the direct route we need to work our way around the energy cycle or finding an alternative route for two x so this would be plus 1609 minus 2630 
plus 13 equals 2x. That means that 2x has the value minus 1008. So what we've done here is just work our way around the energy cycle, find an alternative method, and we're starting in the same place, we're ending in the same place, which means our value will be the same and correct. So then to find x on its own, or the enthalpy change of hydration on its own, we take minus 1008, divide this by 2, that gives us our final x value of minus 504 kilojoules per mole. So on the answer line for part 3, we need to write minus 504 for kilojoules per mole. To get the two marks for this question, you get one mark for working out what 2x is, so minus 1008, and then one mark for dividing by 2 and working out the enthalpy change of hydration, or x, which is minus 504 kilojoules per mole. Part 4. Predict how the enthalpy changes of hydration of F- minus and Cl- minus would differ. Explain your answer. Firstly, we need to make a comment on the enthalpy change of hydration values, so what they're going to be like visually. And it's going to be more exothermic, or visually this would mean it would have a bigger negative value than chloride minus ions. The reason for this more negative value is because F- minus has a smaller size or a smaller radius um, than Cl minus ions. And this means that if it's got a smaller atomic radius or a smaller ion size, then it's going to have a greater attraction to water. And that will also impact its more exothermic value, hence making it correct, and we've fully predicted now how the enthalpy changes of hydration of F- and Cl- would differ, with F- being more exothermic because of its smaller size and its attraction to water. To get the two marks for this question, you need to comment on the more exothermic value and link it to atomic size or smaller size ion. And then you need to comment on the fact that F- minus has a greater attraction to H2O, or water. Part B. Fluorine reacts with steam as shown in the equation below. Average bond enthalpies are shown in the table. Part 1. Explain what is meant by the term average bond enthalpy. So this is one of our definitions we need to learn. So average bond enthalpy can be defined as the breaking, important we say breaking here, of one mole, again with definitions specifying quantities is really important, of bonds in gaseous, so here we're stating conditions, molecules. To get the two marks for this question, you need to say breaking of one mole of bonds that's your first mark, and then in gaseous molecules is your second mark. Part 2. Calculate the bond enthalpy of the FF bond. Okay, in this type of question, we're going to use the expression reactants minus products. So imagine the arrow for the equation as a minus sign. That's always a good way of remembering this equation. So if we work out the total bond enthalpies of our reactants first, that would be 2x, because we don't know what the FF bond is, plus 2 brackets 2 times 464, because in H2O there are two OH bond enthalpies, or bonds, and we've got a stoichiometry saying that there are two H2Os, so we need a big two in front of this bracket. And then we're going to minus our products. 
So our products will be 498 plus 4 times 568. And we've got our 4 because there are 4 HF bond enthalpies and then there is 1 O double bond O from the oxygen. And this is going to equal minus 598 because that is our delta H value. So if we finished off our reactants minus products equation, that would equal delta H. Now we're going to simplify or rearrange this slightly. So we would have 2x plus 1856, all in brackets still, minus 2770 equals minus 598. If we continue to rearrange, this would be 2x plus 1856 equals 2172. So that means 2x equals 316, making x plus 158, which is what we write on our answer line. Adding a plus means that you really know what you're talking about and it can't be argued that you were like, well, I could have put a minus, I wasn't sure. Putting the plus, extra important, and sometimes it's essential that you put your charge, so plus or minus. For this question, you get your three marks. Your first mark from writing the basic equation where you've worked out the total bond enthalpies of reactants, minus them from the total bond enthalpies of the products and made it equal delta H, that's your first mark. Then rearranging to the point of 2x equals 316 is your second mark. And then writing x is plus 158 is your third mark. This question is about reaction rates. Aqueous iron 3 ions, Fe3 plus aqueous, react with aqueous iodide ions, I minus aqueous, as shown below. A student carries out three experiments to investigate how different concentrations of Fe3 plus aqueous and I minus aqueous affect the initial rate of this reaction. The results are shown below. Part A. Determine the rate constant and a possible two-step mechanism for this reaction that are consistent with these results. Firstly, we need to determine the order of reaction for Fe3 plus and I minus. Let's begin with Fe3 plus. So we're looking for where it has increased by a certain value. Here, it's increased by 2. And where I minus has stayed the same or multiplied by 1. Then you need to look at the initial rate, and this has also multiplied by 2. Therefore, in the rate equation, we would write rate equals k, or the rate constant, square brackets, Fe3 plus to the power of 1, because Fe3 plus is a first order reaction, because when it's doubled, the initial rate is doubled when I minus has remained the same. Then we need to do the same for I minus. So we're looking where Fe3 plus has stayed the same. So for experiments one and three, and for experiments one and three, I minus has doubled. And therefore we need to look at the initial rate and it has quadrupled between experiments one and three. Therefore, in the rate equation, we write I minus to the power of two because it's a second order reaction. We can then use this information to work out K. And K equals the initial rate, so if we take experiment one and its values, it would be 8.10 times 10 to the four, or minus four, divided by four, times 10 to the minus 2 multiplied by 3 times 10 to the minus 2 to the power of 2. And that gives us a k value of 22.5. Next we need to work out the units. So the units for the 
numerator are moles per decimeter cubed per second and for the denominator it's moles per decimeter cubed multiplied by 3. And then if we were to cancel this out we would end up with the units moles to the minus 2 decimeters to the 6 seconds to the minus 1. Because what I've done here is if we expand this numerator we get the same thing. Expanding the denominator we get moles to the 3 decimeters to the minus 9. Cancelling out the moles we are then left with moles to the 2 and then cancelling out the decimeters we're left with decimeters to the minus 6 but it's over 1 therefore it's moles to the negative 2 and decimeters to the 6. Finally we need to work out a two-step mechanism for this reaction. So we need a slow step first and we can write this as a possible example Fe3 plus aqueous plus 2I minus aqueous produces Fe I2 plus as our slow step and then for our fast step we then write Fe I2 plus so what we've just produced in our slow step plus Fe 3 plus aqueous produces 2 Fe 2 plus aqueous plus I 2 aqueous and we notice here that if we cancel out the slow and fast steps so that it will be the ion we've created we are then left with the overall equation we're given in the question so we've got 2 Fe 3 plus aqueous plus 2 I minus aqueous produces 2 Fe 2 plus aqueous plus I2 aqueous and therefore we have been consistent with the results we're given. To get the marks for this question you need to have produced a comprehensive conclusion which uses quantitative results for determination of the reaction orders and determines K from correct rate equation which is what we've done in this question. Because there's an asterisk there aren't specific marking points but as long as you've been comprehensive and clear about your working you've got the correct answers you will get your six marks. Part B. A student carries out an investigation to find the activation energy Ea and the pre-exponential factor A of a reaction. The student determines the rate constant K at different temperatures T. The student then plots a graph of ln K against 1 over T as shown below. Part 1. Draw a best fit straight line and calculate the activation energy in joules per mole. Give your answer to three significant figures and show all your working. Firstly, we need to draw our line of best fit. So we need a ruler. And the line of best fit does not need to intercept the y-axis here. We are just drawing our line of best fit for the range of the data points we've been given, like so. Now we've drawn our best straight line, or best fit straight line, we need to calculate the activation energy. In order to do this, we need to find the gradient of the line. If we take two data points of the, on the line, 29 and 28, and see where they fall on the x-axis, we have 2.90 and 4. So 2.90 for 29 and 4 for 28. But we need to pay careful attention to the units for 1 over t times 10 to the negative 3. So in working out the gradient, we need to do 29 minus 28 divided by 2.9 times 10 to the negative 3 minus 4 times 10 to the negative 3. That gives us a gradient value 
of minus 909. The reason we've worked out gradient is because we're using the equation LNK equals minus EA over RT plus LNA. So by plotting a graph of LNK against 1 over T, we've got a Y equals MX plus C graph or a straight line graph. Therefore, the gradient is equal to minus EA over R. So in order to find EA or the activation energy, we need to take the negative gradient that would be plus 909 and multiply this by R, which is a constant you get given in your data sheet. You also get given this rearranged formula of the Arrhenius equation in your data sheet that we've used to plot this line. And that constant is 8.314, which gives you an activation energy value of 7,557.4. But we're asking the question to give our answer to three significant figures. Therefore, that makes our final answer 7,560 joules per mole. To get the three marks for this question, you get one mark for working out the gradient correctly, one mark for then rearranging the Arrhenius equation and working out activation energy, and then you get one mark for using scales, so writing your answer to three significant figures, and also looking at the scale of the graph and noticing that 1 over t is 10 to the negative 3, so including that in your gradient. Those two points in this question get you your third mark. Part 2. Use the graph to calculate the value of the pre-exponential factor a. Show your working. So also using this rearranged Arrhenius equation, ea is equal to the y-intercept and so in order to find a or the pre-exponential factor we need to find the y-intercept first. So extrapolating the y-intercept by continuing this line we end up here and this is 31.4 on the graph. So ln a is equal to 31.4, meaning that a is equal to e to the 31.4, which gives us the pre-exponential value of 4.33 times 10 to the 13, which is what we write on our answer line. To get the two marks for this question, you get your first mark for working out LNA is 31.4 or working out the y-intercept. And then the, your second mark for working out that A is e to the power of your y-intercept and working out that value. Nitrogen monoxide, NO, and oxygen, O2, react to form nitrogen dioxide, NO2, in the reversible reaction shown in equilibrium 18.1. Part A. Write an expression for Kc for this equilibrium and state it the units. Kc is in terms of concentration, and in an expression for Kc you include all parts of the equilibrium in the same state. In equilibrium 18.1, all parts of the equilibrium are gaseous, so all parts are included. In an expression for Kc, you work backwards across your equilibrium. So the forwards reaction, which is here, you would do backwards. So nitrogen dioxide would be your numerator. So we use square brackets to signify concentration. And then we're writing to the power of 2. And that is because of the stoichiometry in the equilibrium. There is a 2 in front of the nitrogen dioxide. So it's raised to the power of 2. Then for our denominator, we have nitrogen monoxide raised to the power of 2 multiplied by oxygen raised to the power of 1. So we don't need to write it. In terms of units, well, the square brackets mean moles per decimeter cubed. So if we were to rewrite this equation as units, 
we would have moles per decimeter cubed to the power of 2 on our numerator and moles per decimeter cubed to the power of 3 on our denominator. So if we were to expand this, we would have moles squared decimeters to the minus 6 divided by moles cubed times decimeters to the minus 9. So if we were to cancel out this fraction, we can cancel out the moles on the numerator and two of the moles on the denominator. So we're left with moles to the minus 1 or moles to the 1 over 1. And then we cancel out the decimeters to the minus 6 and we cancel out the minus 9 and replace it with a minus 3. So that equals 1 over moles per decimeter cubed. Another way of writing this on the answer line would be moles to the minus 1 decimeters cubed. To get the two marks for this question, you need to have the correct expression for Kc and the correct units for Kc. Part B. A chemist mixes together nitrogen and oxygen and pressurises the gases so that their total gas volume is 4 decimeters cubed. The mixture is allowed to reach equilibrium at constant temperature and volume. The equilibrium mixture contains 0.4 moles of nitrogen monoxide and 0.8 moles of oxygen. Under these conditions, the numerical value of Kc is 45. Calculate the amount in moles of nitrogen dioxide in the equilibrium mixture. Firstly, let's highlight the key pieces of information in part B. One, that the total gas volume is 4 decimeters cubed. And then the number of moles of nitrogen monoxide, oxygen and the value of Kc. Because we're given the number of moles and the volume, we can use the equation triangle NV times C in order to work out concentration, which is what Kc is expressed in terms of. If we begin by working out the concentration of nitrogen monoxide, that would be 0.4 divided by 4, which gives us 0.1 moles per decimeter cubed. The same thing can be done to work out the concentration of oxygen, and that would be 0.8 divided by 4, which gives us 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed of oxygen. Next, we need to substitute these values into our expression for Kc. So that would be 45 equals, we don't know the concentration of nitrogen dioxide, so we write that the same as our expression, then divided by 0.1 squared times 0.2. Next, we need to rearrange to find nitrogen dioxide squared. That would be 45 times 0.1 squared times 0.2, which gives us 0.09. Then, to find out the concentration of nitrogen dioxide, we need to square root 0.09, which gives us 0.3 moles per decimeter cubed. Finally, the question is asking us for the amount in moles of nitrogen dioxide. Therefore, we need to do the reverse of what we've done in our first step and take concentration and multiply it by our volume, which is 4 decimeters cubed, and that gives us 1.2 moles of nitrogen dioxide, which is what we write on our answer line. To get the four marks for this question, you get one mark for working out the concentration of nitrogen monoxide and oxygen. Together, that gets you one mark. You get your second mark for working out the concentration of nitrogen dioxide squared, which is 0.09. And then you get your third mark for rooting 0.09 and working out the concentration of nitrogen dioxide. And your final mark for working out the moles which would be the concentration times 4 or volume and writing 1.2 on your answer line. Part C. 
The values of Kp for equilibrium 18.1 at 298 Kelvin and 1000 Kelvin are shown below. Part 1. Predict with a reason whether the forward reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Even if you were unsure what the answer was for this question, you can state the trend shown in the table. And that trend is that Kp decreases as the temperature is increased from 298 Kelvin to 1000 Kelvin and so we can then make a suggestion as to what the forward reaction is and the forward reaction is therefore exothermic. If you didn't know the answer it's worth making a revision resource because this is quite a common question and it comes up a lot so it's really useful to know this very well before going into your exams. To get the mark for this question you need to say that it's exothermic or the forward reaction is exothermic and that Kp decreases as temperature increases. Both are required to get the mark. Part 2. The chemist increases the pressure of the equilibrium mixture at the same temperature. State and explain in terms of Kp how you would expect the equilibrium position to change. Firstly, we need to talk about the equilibrium position and how this is going to shift due to an increase in pressure. So the equilibrium position is going to shift to the right and I will explain why. And that is because it shifts to the side with a fewer number of moles of gas. On the left, there are three. And on the right there are two, so the equilibrium position is going to shift to the right. Next we need to talk about the ratio in the Kp expression. And what's going to happen to this ratio is it's going to decrease. And that is because the denominator is going to increase more than the numerator, therefore decreasing the ratio in the Kp expression. And in any question where you're asked about Kp and the effect of Kp, you need to say the final thing would be the ratio increases in this case. It could be decreases, but the main thing is it's going to restore Kp. And this is a phrase you'll write in any question when you're asked about Kp and how it changes due to temperature or pressure or any conditions. To get the three marks for this question, you get your first mark for talking about equilibrium position shifting, your second mark talking about the ratio in Kp changing, and then your third mark for talking about the ratio increasing to restore Kp. This question is about acids and bases found in the home. Part A. Ethanoic acid, CH3COOH, is the acid present in vinegar. A student carries out an experiment to determine the pKa value of ethanoic acid. The concentration of ethanoic acid in the vinegar is 0 0.870 moles per decimeter cubed. The pH of the vinegar is 2.41. Part 1. Write the expression for the acid dissociation constant Ka of ethanoic acid. The basic expression for Ka is that Ka equals H plus times A minus divided by HA. If we apply this to ethanoic acid, our expression for Ka would be H plus multiplied by CH3COO minus as our A minus and then over ethanoic acid or CH3COOH. To get the mark for this question you need to have the correct expression for Ka. Part 2. Calculate the pKa value of ethanoic acid. Give your answer to two decimal places. First let's highlight key pieces of information in the question. So we've got the concentration of ethanoic acid which we can then plug into the expression for Ka 
We've also got the pH of vinegar, which we can use to work out the concentration of H+, plus, with the general equation being the concentration of H plus equals 10 to the minus pH. So, in part 2, we write the concentration of H plus equals 10 to the minus 2.41, which equals 3.89 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per decimeter cubed. First, we need to make the assumption that the concentration of H plus equals the concentration of A minus. And the reason for this is because all H plus ions must come from the acid. Therefore, when we plug into the equation for Ka, we have Ka equals 3.89 times 10 to the negative 3, bracket squared, because H plus equals A minus, so we're multiplying the same concentration twice. In other words, we're squaring the concentration. And then we're going to divide by the concentration of ethanoic acid, which we've been given in the question, is 0 0.870. So that will equal a Ka value of 1.74 times 10 to the negative 5. But we're asked to work out the pKa value. So we do pKa equals negative log 10. We're using the same equation we would use for pH, but instead of H plus, we're using Ka. So negative log 10 multiplied by 1.74 times 10 to the negative 5 equals our pKa value of 4.76, which we write on the answer line. Just briefly explaining where this equation for pKa comes from. When working out pH, you do negative log 10 H+. Plus. So pKa would be negative log 10 Ka. To get the three marks for this question, you get your first mark for working out H plus concentration, or 3.89 times 10 to the negative 3. You get your second mark for working out Ka is 1.74 times 10 to the negative 5 and your third mark for working out the pKa value correctly and writing it to two decimal places, so 4.76. Part 3. Determine the percentage dissociation of ethanoic acid in the vinegar. Give your answer to three significant figures. To answer this question, we first need to know the equation for percentage dissociation. So the equation for percentage dissociation is the concentration of H plus divided by the concentration of HA multiplied by 100. In this question, that would be the concentration of H plus, which we've worked out is 3.89 times 10 to the negative 3, divided by the concentration of HA, which is 0 0.870 times 100, gives us a percentage of 0.447% to three significant figures. So writing this on the answer line, 0.447%. To get the mark for this question, you need to write 0.447 on the answer line in order to get this mark. Part B. Many solid drain cleaners are based on sodium hydroxide, NaOH. A student dissolves 1.26 grams of a drain cleaner in water and makes up the solution to 100 centimetres cubed. The student measures the pH of this solution as 13.48. Determine the percentage by mass of NaOH in the drain cleaner. Give your answer to three significant figures. Firstly, let's highlight key pieces of information we need to use in this question. Firstly, the mass of drain cleaner that the student is dissolving and the volume the solution is made up to. Then the fact that the pH of the solution is 13.48 and we're asked to give our answer to three significant figures. These are the key pieces of information in this question. Like in part A, we're going to be using the equation H plus equals 10 to the minus pH to work out our H plus concentration. In the setting of this question, 
that would be 10 to the minus 13.48, which gives us an H plus concentration of 3.31 times 10 to the negative 14 moles per decimeter cubed. But we're dealing with a strong base, sodium hydroxide, so we need to work out the concentration of OH minus ions, which will be Kw divided by the concentration of H plus ions. In this question, you get given the value of Kw in your data sheet, and that is 1 times 10 to the negative 14. And then we divide it by the concentration of H plus ions, which we've worked out is 3.31 times 10 to the negative 14, which gives us an OH minus concentration of 0 0.302 moles per decimeter cubed. Next, we need to focus on how we can calculate the percentage by mass of sodium hydroxide in the drain cleaner. In order to do this, we need to use two equation triangles, our first being NV times C to work out moles, and our second being mass is equal to moles times RFM. So firstly, working out moles, that would be concentration 0 0.302 times by volume, which is 100. We're given that in the question, as we're told that's the volume the student makes a solution up to. But we're told it's centimetres cubed, and we want decimetres cubed, so we need to times by 10 to the negative 3 to get 0 0.0302 moles. Then, working at mass, that would be 0 0.0302 times the relative formula mass of sodium hydroxide, which is 40. So that gives us a mass of 1.21 grams, and we want the percentage by mass of sodium hydroxide in the drain cleaner. So that would be 1.21 divided by 1.26 times 100, which gives us a percentage of 95.9%. Writing this on the answer line, 95.9, that's to three significant figures. To get the four marks for this question, you get your first mark for working out the concentration of H+, your second mark for working out the concentration of OH-, your third mark for working out the mass of NaOH in the drain cleaner, and your fourth mark for working out the percentage by mass of NaOH in the drain cleaner, so 95.9, which is the answer written to three significant figures. Part C. Sodium carbonate. Na2CO3 is a base used in washing soda. Na2CO3 contains the carbonate ion CO3 2 minus shown below. Draw the dot and cross diagram for the carbonate ion. Show outer electrons only and use different symbols for electrons form C and O and any extra electrons. In this question we're given the structure of a carbonate ion. So we can use this as a guide when drawing our dot and cross diagram. We'll have our central carbon, our single bond between two carbon and oxygens, and then a double bond between a carbon and oxygen in the carbonate ion. Oxygen has six electrons on its outermost shell, so we can complete the electrons around oxygen by completing the number six. So in the carbon double bond oxygen, it's already donated two to make the double bond, so we have four more to fill. And in the single bonds, they have five more to fill its outer shell because it's only used one to make its single bond. But it needs eight in its shell or outer shell. The carbon double bond oxygen has eight already, but the carbon single bond oxygens don't. They also have a negative charge, so that's reinforcement that we've done this correctly. And we're told to use different symbols for electrons from carbon and oxygens and any extra electrons. The extra electrons are what create the negative charge, so we could use a square or a rectangle, for example. And finally, we need to put our dot and cross diagram in square brackets with a 2 minus charge to signify that it's an ion we've drawn here. To get the two marks for this question, you need to have the correct dot and cross diagram 
with the correct electrons and different symbols and the two minus charge. This question is about the halogen group of elements and some of their compounds. Part A. The halogens show trends in their properties down the group. The boiling points of three halogens are shown below. Explain why halogens show this trend in boiling points. For any question where you're asked to describe a trend, you need to specify which direction. So we're going to go down the group. What happens down the group is that London forces of attraction increase. They're sometimes referred to as van der Waals forces, but London forces is accepted here. And it's because the number of electrons increases. So this is your second statement you need to write for this question. And then you need to link to why the trend in boiling points, and that's because if there's more London force of attraction or they're increasing, more energy is needed to break the London forces of attraction. Again, saying London forces, not van der Waals, because of the specification we're on. To get your three marks for this question, you get your first mark for saying that London forces increase, your second mark for saying that electrons increase, and your third mark for saying that more energy is needed to break the London forces of attraction, or London forces. Part B. Hydrogen iodide, HI, is decomposed by heat into its elements. The decomposition is much faster in the presence of a platinum catalyst. Complete the enthalpy profile diagram for this reaction using formulae for the reactants and products. Use EA to label the activation energy without a catalyst. Use EC to label the activation energy with a catalyst. And use delta H to label the enthalpy change of the reaction. The first thing we need to notice about this question is that we have a positive enthalpy change of reaction. That means that the reaction is endothermic, so that will impact the shape of our enthalpy profile diagram. The shape will be that we have our reactants on the bottom, so 2HI gas, and our products at the top, H2 gas plus I2 gas. Then we're going to have two different enthalpy profile diagrams effectively with two different activation energies labelled. We'll have one which is slightly higher and one which is slightly lower. Then labelling our activation energies with and without catalysts. The slightly higher enthalpy profile diagram will be our activation energy without a catalyst and our slightly lower enthalpy profile diagram will be our activation energy with a catalyst. Finally, we need to label the enthalpy change of reaction, and it's a positive value, so we're going to go from our reactants to products upwards, because enthalpy is increasing, and we'll label it delta H. To get the three marks for this question, you get your first mark for having your reactants and products on the right sides, of the, or the correct sides of the progression of reaction. So having your reactants on the left and products on the right. You get one mark for having the correct enthalpy change of reaction arrow. And then you get your third mark for having the correct activation energy with and without a catalyst. Part C. Compound A is an oxide of chlorine that is a liquid at room temperature and pressure and has a boiling point of 83 degrees, when 0.4485 grams of A is heated to 100 degrees Celsius at 1.00 times 10 to the 5 pascals, 76.0 centimetres cubed of gas is produced. Determine the molecular formula of compound A. Show all your working. Let's begin this question by highlighting key pieces of information we're going to use. Firstly, the mass of A, and then the temperature, pressure, and volume amounts we have been given in this question, because we're going to use the equation PV equals NRT. So we're going to be using something called a list method, and this helps us to understand what we have in the question and what we need to find out. 
So P stands for pressure. We have our pressure is 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Volume, we've been given also 76 times 10 to the negative 6 meters cubed because we're converting units from centimeters cubed into meters cubed for this ideal gas equation. Number of moles, we don't know, so we can leave a question mark because we're going to figure this out. R, we get given in our data sheet, is 8.314. And T stands for temperature, so it'll be 100 degrees Celsius plus 273 equals 373 Kelvin because we're converting degrees Celsius into Kelvin for this equation. So then working out number of moles and rearranging the equation, we need to do PV or 1 times 10 to the 5 times 76 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by RT or 8.314 times 373. That gives us a number of moles value of 2.45 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Then we're going to be using another equation. Mass over number of moles equals the relative formula mass. So working out our relative formula mass, we've been given our mass is 0.4485, dividing by our number of moles, 2.45 times 10 to the negative 3 gives us a relative formula mass of 183. And because we're told in the question it's an oxide of chlorine, that means that our relative formula mass is going to consist of chlorine and oxygen. And we can extrapolate the molecular formula of Cl2O7. This is because the relative formula masses of Cl2O7, so 35.5 times 2, which is Cl2, plus 16 times 7, which is 07, equals 183. So the relative formula masses match, and therefore our answer is correct. To get the four marks for this question, you get your first mark for using the list method and converting all units into the correct units for this equation. So centimetres cubed into metres cubed, degrees Celsius into Kelvin. You get your second mark for correctly working out the number of moles, or 2.45 times 10 to the negative 3. You get your third mark for working out the relative formula mass, or 183. And your fourth mark for correctly determining the molecular formula of A, or Cl2O7. Part D. Compound B is an iodate 5 salt of a group 1 metal. The iodate 5 ion has the formula IO3 minus. A student carries out a titration to find the formula of compound B. Step 1. A student dissolves 1.55 grams of B in water and makes up the solution to 250.0 centimetres cubed in a volumetric flask. Step 2. The student pipettes 25.00 centimetres cubed of the solution of B into a conical flask followed by 10 centimetres cubed of dilute sulfuric acid and an excess of Ki aqueous. The iodate 5 ions are reduced to iodine, as shown below. Step 3. The resulting mixture is titrated with 0 0.150 moles per decimeter cubed Na2S2O3 aqueous. The student repeats step 2 and step 3 until concordant titers are obtained. Part 1. Complete table 20.1 and calculate the mean titer that the student should use for analysing the results. For this question, we need to complete table 20.1. To work out the titers which are missing from table 20.1, we need to do the final burette reading minus the initial burette reading. So for the trial, that would be 24.00. We need to give all of our titer readings to two decimal places. For titration 1, that's 23.40. For titration 2, 23.75. And for titration 3, 23.85. Then we're asked to find the mean titer. In order for the mean titer to be found, we need to use concordant titers. Concordant titers are within 
or plus minus 0 0.10 centimetres cubed of each other. So the concordant titers in this question are from titration 2 and titration 3. So working out the mean titer would be 23.75 plus 23.85. Dividing this by 2 gives us a mean titer value of 23.80. Again, giving our answer to two decimal places, writing this on the answer line. To get the two marks for this question, you get your first mark for correctly completing table 20.1 and your second mark for identifying the concordant results and determining the mean titer, 23.80 centimetres cubed. Part 2. The uncertainty in each burette reading is plus minus 0 0.05 centimetres cubed. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in the titer obtained from titration 1. Give your answer to two decimal places. When working out percentage uncertainty, we take the uncertainty of the equipment, so 0 0.05, multiply it by the amount of times we've used this equipment, in this case twice, to work out the titer for titration 1. So this would be 0 0.05 times by 2 divided by 23.40. Then multiply by 100 in order to work out percentage uncertainty. That gives us an answer of 0.43%. That is our answer to two decimal places, which we will write on the answer line. To get the mark for this question, you need to have the correct percentage uncertainty, 0.43%. Part 3. Describe and explain how the student should determine the end point of this titration accurately. The first point we need to make in this question is that we're going to add an indicator. We're going to add starch as our indicator for this titration. Next, we need to state the colour change starch is going to make to determine the end point of this titration. The colour change is going to be from a blue or black colour to colourless or clear. To get the two marks for this question, you get your first mark for saying to add starch and your second mark for saying the colour change will be from blue to colourless. Part 4. Determine the relative formula mass and formula of the group 1 iodate 5b. Show your working. So what I've done firstly is copy across the information from table 20.1 and our calculated mean titer. Next we need to highlight other key pieces of information in the question. The mass of B the student is using is a key piece of information alongside the volume the student is making the solution up to, 250 centimetres cubed. But the student's using 25 centimetre cubed samples, so there's a factor of 10 we need to account for later on in the question. Then our next key piece of information is the concentration of Na2S2O3 we've been given as 0.15 moles per decimeter cubed. And then thirdly, our mean titer that we have calculated is our next key piece of information in this question because we're going to be using the equation triangle NV times C. So using this equation triangle, we can work out the number of moles of S2O3 to minus. That would be taking volume and multiplying it by concentration. We're given the concentration in the question 0.15 and we've worked out the volume is 23.8 times 10 to the negative 3 because we're converting centimetres cubed into decimetres cubed. That gives us an answer of 3.57 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Then we need to work out the number of moles of IO3 minus. We do this using the two equations we're given in the question. So firstly, we need to look at similarities between the two questions. Well, we know the moles of S2, O3, 2 minus. So we can work out the number of moles of I2. The number of moles of I2 would be half the number of moles of S2, O3, 2 minus. And in the first equation where we're given IO3 minus, they are three times the number of moles of IO3 minus. 
So, working backwards, that means that the number of moles of S2O3 2 minus are six times the number of moles of IO3 minus. So to work out the number of moles of IO3 minus, we take 3.57 times 10 to the negative 3 and divide it by 6. That gives us a number of moles of 5.95 times 10 to the negative 4 moles. Now we need to account for our times 10 or factor of 10. And that is because the number of moles we've just calculated is the number of moles in 25 centimetres cubed. And we've made the solution up to 250 centimetres cubed. So we need to take the number of moles, 5.95 times 10 to the negative 4, and multiply this by 10, which gives us 5.95 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Next, we need to work out the relative formula mass of the group 1 metal. And that would be using the equation mass over moles equals relative formula mass. We've been given the mass in the question, 1.55. We've just calculated the number of moles. So 5.95 times 10 to the negative 3 gives us a relative formula mass of 260.5. So we can write this for the relative formula mass of B that we calculate. And then the formula of B, well, we need to match the relative formula mass to the mass of a group 1 metal. So to find the group 1 metal, we can take the relative formula mass, 260.5, and subtract the relative formula mass of the iodate 5 ion. So that would be 126.9 plus 16 times 3 gives us the relative formula mass of the group 1 metal is 85.6. Matching this to the closest group 1 metal, that is rubidium. So the formula of B would be RBIO3. To get the five marks for this question, you get your first mark for working out the moles of S2O32 minus correctly, your second mark for working out the number of moles of IO3 minus correctly your third mark for working out the number of moles of IO3 minus in the 250 centimetre cube solution, so multiplying by 10. Your fourth mark comes from working out the relative formula mass of B, so 260.5. And then your fifth mark is working out the relative formula mass of the group 1 metal and then determining that this is rubidium and then writing the correct formula of B. That's your fifth mark. This question is about some reactions of D-block elements and their ions. Table 21.1 shows standard electrode potentials which will be needed within this question. Part A. Complete the electron configuration of an Ni atom and an Ni2 plus ion. The electronic configuration for a nickel atom is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d8. For a nickel 2 plus ion, most of the electronic configuration from the nickel atom will stay the same. So we'll have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. But here at the end, we're going to change the electronic configuration to lose two electrons because we're forming a nickel 2 plus ion. So we're going to lose both 4s electrons because they are filled first and lost first. So to complete the electronic configuration we'll have 3d8. To get the two marks for this question you get a mark for each electronic configuration that's correct. So a mark for the correct electronic configuration of a nickel atom and the correct electronic configuration of a nickel 2 plus ion get you your two marks. Part B. A standard cell is set up in the laboratory with the cell reaction shown below. Part 1. Draw a labelled diagram to show how this cell could be set up to measure its standard cell potential.
include details of apparatus solutions and the standard conditions required. To begin, we need to draw two half cells. Half cells are measuring cylinders. We need to draw two measuring cylinders with a solid electrode in each. These electrodes are connected by a voltmeter and they are surrounded by aqueous solutions filled with ions. These solutions are connected by a salt bridge. You need to label salt bridge and what a salt bridge is, is filter paper soaked in ionic solution such as KNO3. So what the electrodes are and what the ionic solutions are, we need to determine. So nickel is a solid. That means it can be an electrode. So we can label an electrode as nickel. But the two iodine and iodide parts of this equation are both aqueous, so they cannot be an electrode. Therefore, we're going to use a platinum electrode. And in the ionic solution, we will have I2 and I minus. But in the nickel electrode solution, we will have Ni2 plus. Next, the standard conditions. The standard conditions are all of the solutions need to be one mole per decimeter cubed in concentration, and the temperature needs to be 298 Kelvin, which is the standard condition for temperature. To get the four marks for this question, you get one mark for having a voltmeter and salt bridge, a mark for two correct half cells, so that's two marks for each correct half cell, and then you get your fourth and final mark for the standard conditions being correct. Part two, predict the standard cell potential of this cell. In this question, we're using the electrode potentials for the nickel and iodine. To work out the standard cell potential, you take the more positive electrode potential, which would be 0.54, and you minus the most negative, so minus 0.25. That would give us a standard cell potential of 0.79 volts, which we can write on our answer line. To get the mark for this question, you need to have the correct standard cell potential. Part C. Use the information in Table 21.1 to help you answer both parts of this question. Part 1. Write the overall equation for the oxidation of Fe2 plus by acidified H2O2. Firstly, we need to identify the electrode potentials we're using. So here I've highlighted them. Next, we need to look at their electrode potential values. The most negative, in this case Fe2 plus, will go backwards and the most positive will go forwards. So rewriting these equations, we would have Fe2 plus goes to Fe3 plus plus an electron and then H2O2 plus 2H plus plus two electrons goes to 2H2O. Next, we need to scale the equations. So we need to match the electrons, which means we need to multiply the ion equation by two in order to have two electrons. Therefore, writing the overall equation so far, we would have Fe2 plus and two of them, plus H2O2 plus 2H plus plus two electrons, goes to 2Fe3 plus plus 2 electrons plus 2H2O. Next we can cancel out. We will cancel out first our electrons and that's all we can cancel out in this equation. So that makes our overall equation 2Fe2 plus plus H2O2 plus 2H plus goes to 2Fe3 plus plus 2H2O. 
To get the mark for this question, you need to have the correct overall equation for the oxidation of Fe2 plus by acidified H2O2. Part 2. Zinc reacts with acidified Cr2O7 2 minus ions to form Cr2 plus ions in two stages. Explain why this happens in terms of electrode potentials and equilibria. Include overall equations for the reactions which occur. In the first stage of this reaction, we're going to react zinc with acidified Cr2O7 2 minus. Here I've highlighted the two electrode potential equations we're going to be using in this question. Firstly, we need to identify the more negative electrode potential because its equilibrium will shift backwards. And then the more positive electrode potential, its equilibrium will shift forwards. So if we begin by writing the equations, we have zinc goes to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons and then chromium 2 O7 2 minus plus 14 H plus plus 6 electrons go to 2 chromium 3 plus plus 7 H2O. So we can create an overall equation for this stage by scaling our electrons. So that means we need to multiply the zinc equation by 3 in order to create 6 electrons. So writing the overall equation, we would have 3ZN plus Cr2 O7 2 minus plus 14 H plus plus 6 electrons goes to 3ZN2 plus plus 6 electrons plus 2 Cr3 plus plus 7 H2O. We can then cancel out the electrons from both sides of the equation, which makes our overall equation for stage 1 3Zn plus Cr2O7 2 minus plus 14H plus goes to 3Zn2 plus plus 2Cr3 plus plus 7H2O. In the next stage, we're going to react zinc with chromium 3 plus and use this electrode potential which I have just highlighted. Like for stage 1, we need to identify the most positive and most negative electrode potentials. The most positive is the chromium electrode potential, so it will shift forwards, and the zinc is still the most negative, so it's going to shift backwards. So rewriting these two equations, we would have Zn goes to Zn2 plus plus 2 electrons and Cr3 plus plus an electron goes to Cr2 plus. Next we need to scale the electrons so that means multiplying the Cr equation or chromium by 2. So then we have two electrons in both equations. So that means our overall equation would be Zn plus 2 Cr3 plus plus 2 electrons goes to Zn 2 plus plus 2 electrons plus 2 Cr2 plus. Next we can cancel out the two electrons on both sides of the equation. That would then make our overall equation Zn plus 2 Cr3 plus goes to Zn2 plus plus 2 Cr2 plus. So we have completed both stages of this question and zinc has reacted with acidified CrO7 2 minus to form Cr2 plus ions. Then we need to explain why this happens in terms of electrode potentials and equilibria, which is what the question's next asking us to do. In our explanation, we need to make a comment on the electrode potential of zinc and the fact that it is more negative. Then you need to compare, because it's more negative than the electrode potential 
of Cr2O7 2 minus. So we're commenting on the first stage of this question. And what this means is that the zinc system shifts left. We've shown this in our working because we've said it shifts backwards, but saying that it shifts left is a bit more specific. To get the four marks for this question, you get a mark for each correct overall equation. You get a third mark for commenting on the fact that the electrode potential of zinc is more negative than the electrode potential of Cr2O72 minus. And your fourth mark is commenting on the fact that the zinc system shifts left. Part D. Three different reactions of copper compounds are described below. Reaction 1. Aqueous copper 2 sulfate reacts with an excess aqueous ammonia in a ligand substitution reaction. A deep blue solution is formed containing an octahedral complex ion C, which is a trans isomer. Reaction 2. Copper 1 oxide reacts with hot dilute sulfuric acid in a disproportionation reaction. A blue solution D and a brown solid E are formed. Reaction 3. Copper 2 oxide reacts with warm dilute nitric acid in a neutralisation reaction. To form a blue solution, unreacted copper 2 oxide is filtered off and the solution is left overnight in an evaporating basin. A hydrated salt F crystallises with the percentage composition by mass Cu 26.29%, H 2.48%, N 11.59%, O 59.63%. Identify C to F by formulae or structures as appropriate. Include equations and any changes in oxidation number and working. If we first highlight the key pieces of information in reaction 1, we're reacting aqueous copper 2 sulfate with an excess of aqueous ammonia in a ligand substitution reaction to form complex ion C. That means that the reactants for this equation would be CuH2O6 because we're using aqueous copper 2 sulfate and then 2 plus because of the 2 in brackets plus 4 NH3 which is ammonia and then we would produce complex ion C which would be CuH2O2 NH3 4 square brackets 2 plus because our charge hasn't changed and then to balance the equation we need to have 4 H2O. So if we rewrite C that is Cu H2O 2 NH3 4 square brackets 2 plus. I've rewritten it just for the clarity for the marker so that they fully understand that you know what you're talking about. Next, we're asked to show the octahedral complex ion or the structure. So we're going to use a 3D diagram, which means we're going to use wedges. Firstly, drawing out an octahedral layout with wedges. This is something you need to know because it's a standard thing that comes up when talking about transition metals in particular, which is what this question's asking. So here I've drawn our octahedral layout with wedges and then we need to add our H2O and NH3s onto this layout. So our H2Os would go at the top and bottom making sure that the copper bonds to the oxygen in the H2O and then the ammonias or NH3s will go around and the copper will bond to the nitrogen. So making sure that this is clear all around the molecule. So N3H is what I've done on the left, just to show that the copper is bonding to the nitrogen. And then we're going to have square brackets with a 2 plus charge because it's an ion, C is an ion. The reason that I've put H2O at the top and bottom or on opposite sides of this complex ion is because we're told that it's a trans isomer. Looking at reaction 2, we have copper 1 oxide reacting with hot dilute sulfuric acid in a disproportionation reaction. A disproportionation reaction means oxidation and reduction happen simultaneously to the same element. So we need to find D and E 
in reaction to. So firstly, writing reaction to, we would have Cu2O plus H2SO4, which is copper one oxide reacting with dilute sulfuric acid. And then that would produce CuSO4 plus H2O plus Cu or copper. So identifying D and E, D would be CuSO4 because we're told that D is a blue solution and copper sulfate is a blue solution. And then E would be copper on its own because it's a brown solid and we're told that E is a brown solid. Next we need to show that this reaction is a disproportionation reaction. We do this using oxidation numbers. So we need to first calculate the oxidation number of copper in Cu2O. So we know that oxygen has a 2 minus oxidation number and so Cu2 must have a 2 plus oxidation number. So dividing that by 2 to get Cu on its own or copper on its own is 1 plus. Then copper sulfate that would have a 2 plus charge and that is because a sulfate ion has a 2 minus charge and any compound must have an overall oxidation value of 0. Copper on its own therefore would have an oxidation number of 0. So we can write that copper goes from plus 1 to 2 plus and 0 in terms of oxidation numbers. Then looking at reaction 3 we have copper 2 oxide reacting with warm dilute nitric acid in a neutralization reaction to form a blue solution. So firstly writing this reaction we would have CuO plus 2HNO3 because that's nitric acid and that would produce CuNO3 brackets 2 plus H2O to balance the equation. Next we're told that the unreacted copper 2 oxide is filtered off and the solution is left overnight in an evaporating basin and the hydrated salt F crystallizes with the percentage compositions by mass which we're given. That means we need to work out the empirical formula of the hydrated salt F and the molecular formula but first empirical formula. That means we take the percentage so for copper that would be 26.29 divided by 63.5 for hydrogen that is 2.48 divided by 1 for nitrogen that is 11.59 divided by 14 and for oxygen 59.63 divided by 16 so that would give us for copper 0.41 for hydrogen 2.48 for nitrogen that gives us 0.82 and for oxygen that gives us 3.72 so then we divide by the smallest that would be 0.41 to get our empirical formula and then we can scale up for our molecular formula if we're left with a 0.5 for example, we would scale up by multiplying by 2. But if that's not relevant, then that would be our molecular formula we're going to produce. So dividing by 0.41, we get 1. And then we get for hydrogen, 6. For nitrogen, 2. And oxygen, we get 9. So that makes our molecular formula CuH6N2. O9, and it's a hydrated salt so we're going to have FBCuNO3 2 because that's what's produced in equation 3 and then the hydrated would mean a 0.3 H2O for F or hydrated salt F. To get the six marks for this question you need to have all three reactions covered in detail with C, D, E and F identified with clear explanations and equations with oxidation numbers and structures being correct where appropriate.